Great. Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Hans, the guy working on the graphics drivers. Um, when deciding what to talk about, I thought, what, what can I talk about? Because the drivers are kind of complicated, and to be honest, by themselves, they don't, they're essential, but they don't really do anything until you have other software to use it. So I thought what I'd do is I'll just go on a tour through the graphics system, starting right at the beginning with the original chipset. So this is a very simplified block diagram of the original chipset, dropping off stuff like audio and that. So what you've got is you've got the CPU telling the chip Agnes what to do. So that, that's where the, the blitter and the, the copper and all that was, was running. That read and wrote uh, graphics to chip RAM, and then I believe it was Denise that actually ran the display out onto the monitor. So the nice thing was that you had a coprocessor, you know, like a, a mini G proto GPU. It did stuff in parallel to the CPU. Next stage was, was moving on to retargetable graphics. So Picasso 96 for Amiga OS 4, there's cyber graphics and a few other ones as well. Uh, you might notice if I switch back, the block diagram is exactly the same. Replaced Agnes with a Blitter unit, VRAM, and you've got a display controller. The difference is higher resolutions, more colors, that kind of thing. So doing the same thing on more modern hardware. Um, moving along, this is so fairly recent 2D stuff. Well, 2008. In introduced in Amigo as 4.1, we got compositing, which basically means you can blend multiple images together. Uh, smoothly, with an alpha channel that says what, how transparent things should be. So the, this is ups, really ups the visual quality of what you can do. Moving along even further, the next step was the new Radeon HD cards don't have a hardware overlay anymore. And we still wanted to have, you know, a slightly accelerated uh, video playback. So in the 2.0 Radeon HD driver, we introduce composited video. So what that does is the composite ta tags function that did all of this uh, can now read the YUV bitmaps that come out from the video decoder directly and do the YUV to RGB conversion directly on the GPU. So that offloads it off the CPU, freeing up the CPU for more stuff. And it actually speeds it up in a second way as well. The, the YUV frames are smaller, they're kind of compressed. So you've got less to transfer to the, to the graphics card. Uh, advantages over overlay because it's not the same. The biggest, biggest advantage is you can actually write your video frames to anywhere. Uh, with overlay, I think you usually had maybe up to two surfaces. So you could run two overlay windows at once and after that you're out of luck. So you can have as many video uh, windows running at the same time. And use uh, composited video. The other advantage is everything you can do with compositing, you can do with video frames as well. So you can do crossfades, wipes, transitions, you can do alpha masking, um, you can even embed the video in a 3D scene using the, uh, the tricks that I've used in the, uh, the Boeing World demo. Moving on to 3D, so we're jumping back in time. Back in time to about 1998, we got Warp 3D, which was based on the hardware of the time. And this is kind of how the, how the task was separated out. So the, the graphics card was basically doing the rasterization. And all of the 3D calculations, the, tra the transformation from 3D to 2D, the clipping and the lighting, all that was done on the CPU. So, you know, it was a step forward, you can do 3D, but the CPU's still got a lot to do. Um, before I move on to, like, Walk 3D now, but this is block, a very simplified block diagram of a modern GPU. So the, the big change here is instead of a blitter unit, you've got a, a GPU that can run shaders. So you can, a developer can write code compile it and have it run on the GPU itself. 
the other thing is, and this, this, this command processor here, this is in the old Radeon 9000 and 7000 series as well. Basically, the, what you want to do is you want to keep the GPU running in parallel with the CPU as much as possible. So sending one command at a time, um, yeah, it, it just slows things down. So you've got a command processor, you can send it batches of commands and queue them up and try, yeah, try to keep that GPU running and not idling while the CPU is off doing other things. So now we're on to Warp 3D Nova, which is what I've been working on for just over a year, I think. Uh, I guess two things you can notice. The first thing is this looks more complicated than Warp 3D. Uh, but the other thing is this dotted line here between the CPU and the GPU has been moved all across the left. So the GPU is doing transformation, clipping and lighting, the shading, you know, ev everything. The vertices are stored in, in VRAM as well, so the only thing that the CPU has left to do is to update data when necessary and tell the GPU, render this, render this, render this, then, you know, swap the buffers or whatever. Take you through the process. This is the, um, when they asked me to do this, to write what you know, when Aon asked me to write this, thing that worried me the most was I have never written a compiler before in my life, so this is my proof of concept. Um, world's Boring's demo, you have a bunch of rotating cubes, but the, the big thing was the compiler worked. I could prove that I could run, write software, get the compiler, compile it to the GPU's assembly code, and then have it work. So, once I'd done that, I started, it took me a few months, I started development on, in May, got this up and running in August. From there I could move on to actually design the API properly, so by November I had enough working to get the Gears demo working. Well, sort of, if you look closely you'll see that the Z buffer's not in there yet. So that, that green cog's not supposed to be sitting on top of the red one, um, but that was uh, by February, I was doing per pixel lighting, and that's that. Eventually, in May, that was the first pre-release, and I've sort of been working on uh, adding features and, and other stuff since. It's a big question: is what can we do with Warp 3D Nova? First thing is faster, more detailed graphics, because you've got the GPU doing more. Um, that's the big thing. The GPU does more. The CPU has got more time for other things. We finally got GPU accelerated TCL, and you can do more than that, as I said, for pixel lighting as well. Um, and because you can run your own code on the GPU, you can make up your own lighting models, you can you know, do animation on the GPU even, um, and even perform non-graphics processing if you can come up with the algorithms that work within the graphics framework. And then, this isn't my work, this is Daniel put the, wrote the, the OpenGL ES2 wrapper, which we, we needed some form of OpenGL support because it's a big standard, it's cross-platform. We really want to really have that. So, it enables you to take, write, write cross-platform games or put OpenGL games from other platforms. I guess just to preempt this one, why ES2 instead of OpenGL desktop? The reason is, OpenGL ES2 drops the flex, uh, sorry, the fixed pipeline, the old, all the old legacy stuff, and it just makes writing the wrapper so much easier. Um, emulating the fixed pipeline in shaders is more complicated than it sounds uh, when you actually try to do it. So that's all I actually have. So if anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah? So the ES is a wrapper around uh, Warp 3D Nova, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's a fairly thin wrapper too, right? Because it's got roughly the same feature set. Yeah. Yeah. A little question about the uh, compiler infrastructure for your shader program. Yeah. Uh, does it have a bytecode that it compiles from? Yes. So that, okay. So I took the the spur v. Oh, okay. So he he's asking if the compiler has a bytecode format. So, 
we took the Spur V standard, which is what Vulkan will be is using. Um, so what you do is you take your G GLSL com uh, shader, compile that to Spur V, and then that's what Warp 3D Nova reads. Okay, so theoretically, you could write shaders in a different language if you can find a compiler that will compile it to Spur V. Right. Yeah. Yeah? So presumably, if you can write your own code to run within the GPU, uh, GPU yeah. does that mean that you can write uh, functions and whole programs and call them from outside almost as though you were running stuff from a shelf? Um, no, because you've, you've still got a graphics pipeline. So for example, the vertex shader, um, that's designed to read in vertices and output transform vertices with any other information that's need. And the pixel or fragment shader is designed to read those transform vertices and will not read the, no, because the, sorry, there's a rasterizer in between which converts the vertices or triangles into pixels. And then the fragment shader reads in the input data and outputs pixels. You would need that sort of information to, for instance, uh, rotate an image of a planet yeah. and show the lighting changing on the planet as it rotates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, does this mean that you now only have to feed in uh, set planet during the late end of the uh, Yeah, yeah, you... pretty much, because you have, that's usually what you put in the vertex shader. The vertex shader, you give it a transformation matrix or two, um, and then you take your 3D model run it through that matrix and that projects it onto the screen. Um, so that, that, that's why the GPU can do it instead of the CPU. Uh, but what I, what I was meaning is you can't just write arbitrary code um, the way that you do it on, on the CPU. I think building up a library of useful things to help you in this particular display, this particular game. Or yeah, so, so I mean, it's particularly designed for graphic stuff. Um, so, so long as it's within that framework, you can, whatever you can make up. Um, the shader language does have function calls uh, and things like that. So, and how do you access that ability? Uh, sorry, how do you expose, how do you, the, the device driver, expose that ability to the outside world? Um, so the, you call a function to say load this shader file and compile it, or you can load it from memory. Um, the application developer. The application developer calls Warp 3D Nova, a Warp 3D Nova function to compile a shader, and as long as the as long as the compilation succeeded, then you can link that into a shader pipeline and tell it I want to render these triangles with that shader and those textures. That's pretty much how you do it. So you, you load all your data into VRAM, into, into vertex buffers, data buffers, and then you say, okay, so render that stuff with that shader, go. Um, yeah, so you know, fundamentally there's, there's really a few functions that you keep on calling. You say, draw this, draw this, now draw that. Anything else? Yeah? So I've been out of the graphics thing for a while, so I might missed some parts. So why not do an OpenGL ES implementation or a newer one based on a bolt or whatever and make a wrapper of graphics uh, warps and D's for that? Why did you do right. this? What are the advantages of that? Um, reasons. You mean write a wrapper for the old warp 3D? Uh, no, or? I'd say like warp 3D's maybe was specific as far as I know. Why not do a standard implementation like OpenGLES? For OpenGLES? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, the reason was with Warp 3D Nova, I could really design the API the way that the hardware works. Um, whereas Open OpenGLES 2, even though it's you know a modern shader based system, it's still got some old assumptions in there old ways of doing things. For example, one of the things that I do is you upload your uniform variables. They, those are the shape constants in, in DirectX. You upload them to a data buffer object. 
Now you can do that with the very latest OpenGL. Uh, they have extensions to do that. Um, but that it's an extension. It's not, you know, you still have to do the old stuff as well. So this allowed me to just sort of, you know, let's just ditch that and focus on the way the, the hardware works. And then the OpenGL ES wrap is just going to be a thin wrapper on top. That, you know, maps okay, things. So what about if you had chosen a different graphics architecture, like some of the ones that are coming out, not OpenGL? Yeah, I haven't followed the like, like Vulkan yeah. or, or Mantle? Why don't I that natively and then do a wrapper for that? Yeah, one of the reasons was the Vulkan API wasn't stable okay. when I started, which is a big reason to yeah, you know, right. avoid it. Yeah. Um, the other difficulty that we have are the Southern Islands graphics cards that we're using. They're little Endian, PowerPC's big Endian, and Vulkan's kind of like Here's this big buffer you can throw in what you like, when you like. Um, and then it's, well, now we've got to somehow transform from a big Andy into a little Andean format without knowing what's there. So, yeah, I'm not completely sure how you do Vulkan. Uh, and the other, the other thing is that I looked at the Vulkan API, and it is definitely powerful, but the power comes with an insane amount of uh, th things that you need to do. All right, so it really is, okay, we're going to give you as low level access as you can, and if you shoot yourself in the foot, your problem. Right. Um, so yeah, it allows them to do some very, very good things, but it is not that easy to use. Yeah. So, yeah? Um. Uh, two, two related questions, or partially related questions. One is, uh, has any of the work that you've done over the last year allow uh, you to get any closer to potentially uh, supporting um, OpenCL at all? OpenCL. Um, I guess the answer is sort of. Like, the, the really base stuff is in there. Um, I have a shader compiler now. Um, the thing with OpenCL is there's a lot more instructions and a lot more, yeah, difficult stuff to deal with. So theoretically, some of the some of the groundwork's been laid, but yeah, it's not like you can just compile it and off you off you go. See, it's like modern GPUs are so much more powerful than than the PowerPC CPUs we're pairing with them. Right. Uh, it seems like there's strong desire to be able to offload. To offload as, as much, much as you can, can to the GPU. Yeah, right. which which makes sense because the GPU is great for anything that you can have running in parallel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, it's a progression. We just released recently in three point two. Uh, how far down the road are you? Uh, for what 3D Nova? Um, with the stuff that's currently on the roadmap, I'm hoping early next year. It's one of those things that it's always hard to guess exactly what, what's going to so turn what's, up. What's the next step? What's the next progression from where we are? From where we are? I've still got some missing features like render to texture, um, which allows you to do more fancy stuff. So you can, you can render something and then use that something as a texture to render something more complicated, do, do filtering and all that kind of stuff. So things, things like that still need to be done. Um, and there are still some missing compiler instructions that I, I have to work on and, and other stuff like that. Um, actually, I might think I put that in a slide. Yeah, yeah, I've got a few other things like point size and line, line width that I thought, well, for version one, we can probably live without it, uh, but at some point they do need to be in there. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, so kind of along the same lines, um, now that uh, OS4 has a really nice uh, 3D system, um, have you been hearing any um, murmurings from any developers that are doing any modern ports or working on new software utilizing the new uh, APIs? I know there are a few people um, using OpenGL ES, and there have been a few people experimenting with what 3D Nova. I know there are things in development. I don't know exactly what they're working on. Um, I just know that they're, they're coming. Yeah. But I don't have any specifics. Yeah. Anything else? 
with a question. It looked like you skipped past the slide there. Oh yeah, yeah, that was just my, just in case someone asks which graphics card do I need. Um, it's kind of, the way they do their numbering is a little complicated, so yes. even I, <laughs> even I have to look it up every time. So if you're looking for that a graphics card that's currently supported with the current version, those are it. As an XAMD employee, I understand. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Would it be possible to uh, have a copy of these slides posted somewhere for people who were unable to see? These ones? Um, sure. It's PDF. Unfortunately, it's a it's a Hollywood script, Perfect. so I'd have to export them as. Images. I, I can do that. That's it. Even, I can do it. Even just uh, an, an HWP file would be fine. I think for a lot of folks. Well, right. Just because the Hollywood Player is uh, available now for you, so yeah. For you, okay. Be fine. But thank you very much. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> See you.